Ah, uh, 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 don't touch that dial. Randy's Old Time Radio Show presents... Green Blood <laughs> no longer any doubt in my mind. So he walked like a man and talked like a man. Mr. Three was not a man, but a plant. And his country, which he called one, is not to be found upon the earth. It is the only possible conclusion to make after what happened to us in the valley of the Infernal River. This constituted the DeLong Geographical Expedition to explore and map the wild, uncharted region of the Andes between Peru and Chile. There was our leader, Professor Anton Demetrius, once of the University of Bucharest, and now one of America's most distinguished adopted scientists. In the valley of the Rio Infanillo, we should find some very significant geological evidence which may well change our present conception of the age of our planet. There was young Leroy Haskell, the secretary of the expedition. Phi Beta Kappa, Ph.D., and as far as I was concerned, a scientific camp follower. He had written a book. The material I shall gather on this junket will make a book that should simply dwarf the success of my reindeer in Iceland. And you know how well received it was. And of course there was me, John Preston. My job was to survey the region and map it for the first time. There were two native guides, Jose and Pablo. We had been warned from the first stay away from the valley of the Infernal River, from which they all said no traveler has ever returned. But we were not to be dissuaded from our purpose. So after a week on the high mountain trails, we came at last to the entrance of the valley. A chasm that could hold ten Grand Canyons. A vast and forbidding valley. Black, dark brown, and deep gray. A horrible scar. The flesh of the earth burned to a crisp. And far, far below the twisting gray shimmer of the Rio Internillo. This is the place, senor. The Valley del Rio Internillo. Do we start back now? We'll spend the next 60 days in this valley. There was no trail. The mules and pack yamas picked their way between boulders ranging in size from a man's head to his house. Jose left the body. Rifle at ready, alert for the slightest danger. The way was steep, pitching us forward against the pommels of our saddles, jostling and jouncing us. It would not be exact to say that I was frightened by this forbidding valley of desolation, but I was depressed by it as I rode along. I was lost in speculation about the warnings we had received when a rifle shot rang. What? Hermanos, something behind that rock. Jose had slipped from his saddle his rifle barrel still smoking. Jose, come back here. But he had disappeared among the boulders, swiftly stalking an unseen prey. What was this, Pablo? Did you see? See, it was a man. Look, there they go. Down there between the rocks. Come on. We slipped from our mules and started down toward the spot where we had seen Jose running after a fleeting yellowish figure. Ah! It is Jose. Hurry. But when we got there, all we found was Jose's gun. That was all, except a splotch of green liquid on the stone. And smaller splotches of green splashed on one boulder after another leading off toward the river. We followed the trail of green splotches, but they dwindled out a quarter of a mile away. We searched for Jose all afternoon, but finally gave up. Toward sundown, pitched our camp near the rocks with the green splotches. While Pablo prepared the evening meal, Professor Demetrius finished a chemical analysis of the green stain. Well, gentlemen, this material is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll? Pure chlorophyll. The substance that makes all plants green. Where would chlorophyll come from in this got the second place where there aren't even any plants? That is a mystery we must set out to solve. Oh, look. Look, the moon's rising. Apropos of nothing. I like to watch the moon rise. 
I find it a source of inspiration. Source of inspiration. Sometimes that knuckle-headed secretary was more than I could bear. In the midst of the riddle of the chlorophyll, he seeks the inspiration of the rising moon. Nevertheless, a moment later, the professor and I also stepped out of the tent into the crisp evening air. Far down at the eastern end of the valley, the disk of the rising moon glimmered between two towering peaks. It looks whiter and more silvery in this latitude. He wears a cloud of mist like the veil of a bride. That's he now. Look here, person. Just because you like the gift of imagery, there's no reason but... My God. Look! Hmm? The moon. The new moon. Setting in the west. He was right. Low in the luminescent western sky was the thin, delicate crescent of the new moon. And to the east, the full moon, which we'd been watching, had disappeared. A phosphorescent mist still hung about the peak. And as we watched, it slowly faded away. And left the valley of the infernal river in deepest blackness. It was more than my mind could cope with. But it didn't bother our bright young man... Next evening, Leroy had a curious report for us. Well, I sold a copy of my book today, Reindeer Nineteen. What? Yes, I got this for it. Gold. Notice of gold. Yes, that's right. Who did you sell it to? Yes, what sucker gave you all that gold? An Indian. An Indian? What happened? Well, I was down the valley way today gathering specimens of flora, and I just sat down to eat my lunch when I saw this Indian behind the rock staring at me. Then he saw the corner of the book sticking up in my knapsack. He pointed at it and he said, What is that, reindeer in Iceland? I was surprised. And then he said just what I had been thinking. That book has a wider reputation than you imagine. I thought it would be quite a gag to sell one of my books to a Peruvian Indian, so I went into a long spiel about what a really fine and useful book it is. That shouldn't have been difficult for you. It wasn't. I ended by telling him that he could have this valued, excellent example of American literature for only three dollars and a half. What is three dollars and a half? He said, have I got three dollars and a half? I was just wondering about that, I said. Now, turn your pockets inside out in your feet. He did. And a lot of pieces of metal spilled on the ground. I took the gold nuggets and told him I'd include the other four copies I brought along. He's dropping back more for them. That's nice. Well, I think I'll turn in soon quite a day. Yes, hasn't it? If I brought more copies of my book, I could clean up down here. <laughs> Next morning, I was awakened by the sound of groaning coming from Haskell's cot. What I saw there awakened me with a start and yanked me to my feet. Professor, Professor Demetrius. Uh, oh, oh John, what's the matter? Come here quickly, oh. please. Something's wrong with Leroy. Uh, what is it? Look. Oh, uh, uh, you said Yes. Uh, uh, his hair is turned white. Overnight. Well, uh, what in the world happened to him? I don't know. Uh, yes, Leroy. Come on, old boy, wake up. Uh, I, Come on, Leroy, wake up. Uh, I... Come on, old fellow, wake up. Come on. What, what, what's the Now, how do you feel? Uh, you hurt anywhere? Oh, my head aches. Oh, my leg burns. Where? Oh, I like uh, here. Let me see. Here, here on my side. Oh, that's a pretty nasty inflammation. More well, like a third degree burn. Oh. Right under your trousers pocket. Oh. Uh, Leroy. Yes. Did you carry that gold in this pocket yesterday? Why, well, uh, yes. And where was it last night? Uh, I put it under my pillow to thank you. Yes, and that accounts for it. That gold is poisoned in some way. Uh, poisoned? What? Oh, no. No. What's the matter? Yes. Here in the mirror, is that me? Something did that stuff turn my hair white? Did, did it tell me? Tell me. Yes, my boy, it did. Oh, no, 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 it's no. Let's look. Look, there he is. I looked up. Standing in the entrance of the tent was an Indian with an enormous head and thickly painted face. He was wearing the usual white shirt and trousers of the cholo, and he was smiling a faint, ironic smile which made me dislike him intensely. The professor was first to recover from the shock of his appearance. Uh, you, did you give our young man here some gold yesterday? I gave the young man some gold for some book. Did you know the gold was poison? Poison? How? Oh. Well, that's what we want you to tell us. I haven't any idea. What effect did it have? Well, you can see for yourself. Oh. Is this the same young man? Yes, you nearly killed him. Oh. How interesting. 
It must be the effect of a metal I carried with the gold. I do not know what you call it in your language. Possibly you may never have heard of it. Here. See this, son. But it's radium. Sure, metallic radium. It's uh, more radium than is known to exist in the entire civilized world. And <laughs> carried around casually in the pocket of the media. But I was burned by the gold. That's right. But the gold had become irradiated by this piece of radium, which I might add is worth several million dollars. You made a bad deal, Leroy. You should have taken the radium and let the gold alone. I wish I'd given the book away. Can two gentlemen ever communicate with each other without using words and sentences? What? Huh? Suppose, Mr. Preston, you desire to communicate with Mr. Benito. Would you How do you know my name? Have we met somewhere before? I'm sure we have not. But when I paused, you talked your name. So naturally, I knew it at once. I believe that's the ancient word for it. Mr. Preston, I perceive that you want to know my name. Well, I have a number. In my country, the citizens are numbered. I'm sure when your own countries become densely populated, you too will adopt an numerical nomenclature. What is your number? 1,752 deaths, 12,657,109 deaths, 654 deaths. Hmm. That's not become a little hard to remember. Where do you come from, Mr. The name of my country is Juan, or Turk. I dare say each of you comes from a country which you call Juan. No. I see I am wrong. America? Romania? Very pretty name. But quite unscientific. Uh, can you read our thoughts before we speak? Certainly. I take the language formed right out of your own mind and use them. If the teacher has no language at all, one can see the TV. I look out of the aluminum age, and that arose from the prehistoric steel age. A very heavy, clumsy metal, I have heard archaeologists say. Oh, breakfast, Pablo. Good, good. Uh, set it up on the table there. It's the interior. To your breast. He is the one. What's that? That man there, he murdered Jose. What? Everything he has on is Jose. He wears Jose's clothes and his shoes. On his finger is Jose's silver ring. I know it. I saw him that day when Jose disappeared. Are you sure, Pablo? Si, 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 si. Pablo is quite right, gentlemen. You admit that you killed Jose? Oh, yes. You realize, Mr. Three, that your confession will place you in jeopardy of the law. Oh, then you do have laws in your country. Well, naturally. Pablo, take that rope there and tie Mr. Three to that chair. Si, senor. You may consider yourself under arrest, sir. Give Pablo a hand, Leroy. Time to kill him. It will be a pleasure. We will have to carry him before a magistrate. That is not inconvenient. Professor Demetrius, you have studied physiology? Yes. And perhaps vivisection? Yes. Then why all this fuss about the killing of a lower animal for scientific ends? A lower animal? It's the three we are all human beings. Granted, Jose did not have the intelligence or culture such as we had. Nevertheless, he was a human being. Said your friend. The pack animal crossed the broken out of the corral. I rushed from the tent, followed by Leroy and the professor. The mules and the yamas had indeed broken through the corral fence. It was stampeding down the valley as if the steel for the seven or so. Pablo tried to head them off, desperately shouting and waving his arms, but his efforts seemed silly in the face of their headlong flight. And then my attention was diverted in another direction. Person, look! Our tent's on fire! It was. A sheet of flame licked up the oil canvas and enveloped the ridge. A prisoner! You're burned to death in there! I'll get him! I ran back to the tent, pulled up the stakes to the rear wall, and shoved into the smoke-filled tent. Mr. Three was still sitting in the chair where we tied him. He slumped queerly, and the brim of his hat had dropped onto his shirt. There was no time to untie him. I picked him up, chair on oil, and rushed out of the tent just as the wall collapsed. It occurred to me that he was remarkably light. John, is he all right? Suffocated, I think. His clothes are burning. Help me beat out the flames. Hey, what's this? Hey, he's collapsed. The clothes are empty. No. No, not quite. The 
Professor tore open Jose's clothes and pulled from within a human skin. What in the world? How do you know? See, there on his arm, the tattoo of the cross. Yes, I remember Jose had such a tattoo. Oh, what, what does it mean? It means that somebody or something has been stalking us, disguised in this... But, but I, I, I don't... It, exactly as a hunter stalks a deer in a deer rope. Then, then it wasn't a human being? It was the devil. They wonder. He knows he's a human being, but he doubts that we are. Did you notice how supercilious he was? He probably thinks of us as the missing link between the apes and himself. We are animals to him. He puts down one of our skins to hunt us down. As we stood in the merciless sunshine in that black valley of hell, we were four frightened men. Powerless to combat the kind of magic or witchcraft or super science which opposed it. And then I noticed a strange thing. A rabbit broke from behind a boulder and dashed between our feet, scampering down the valley toward the river. I looked up and saw Vicuna leaping from boulder to boulder, and there slipping between the rocks was a panther. Suddenly the whole valley seemed alive with flying animals, all rushing headlong toward the river. Rat, cat, civet, and finally a huge Yukamari, the great black bear of the Andes. Lumbered by so close to us, we had to jump out of his way. But he paid us no heed. He was so intent on following the others toward the river. Now, what in the world? Look, up the valley, hopping from rock to rock. But what are they? they? They look like yellow fleas from here. Whatever they are, they must be what stampeded our pack animals. It is the devil driving all the animals into hell. Look again, Pablo. They're getting bigger. They look like men to me. Yellow men. With the agility of mountain goats. As the strange hopping fist figures approached, we could see that they carried some kind of short metal rod that flashed in the sun. The closer they came, the more animals rushed by us. Devil or no devil, it was too much for Pablo. As the beautiful speckled deer came into view, Pablo raised his rifle. Don't shoot. There must be no holes in the skin. We swirled around. Behind us on a large boulder stood Mr. Three. He was naked, having shed Jose's skin. His face still carried the red paint of his Indian masquerade. But the rest of his body was a soft yellow, like a ripe peach. His feet were disagreeably small, which accounted for the ease with which he escaped our rope. In his hand, he carried a small metal rod. I must apologize for setting fire to your tent, gentlemen. It was quite accidental. I did it with this focusing rod as I slipped out of your rope. Focusing rod? Yes. Oh, what does it focus? Radio power. Why, that is the most compact transmitter I've ever seen. It's really quite primitive. I imagine it came into use among things and pieces along with fire, the keystone of the arc, and the remote control rocket. They were all important additions to human knowledge, but their discoverers and the dates of their discovery are lost in prehistoric eras. You men will follow the rest of the quarry to the river. Everyone must go. What did you say? Follow the rest of the animals to the river. Be quick about it. Now look here, Three. We'll do as we please. Why should we go? So our commander can select specimens to carry to the land of one. Oh, I see. He wishes our scientific advice on the selection of animals. <laughs> Your advice? You? You bunch of idiots. He's going to select one of you as a specimen to carry to one. Now get along. I don't want to have to use force. You won't get us any other way. Take cover, men. The four of us threw ourselves behind the boulders. Mr. Three didn't move. He still stood on top of his rock a dozen feet away. I raised my rifle, got his huge, ugly head in my sight, and squeezed the trigger. But the gun never fired, and suddenly my arms and legs were contorted in painful spasms. My body stiffened, and it seemed as though my brain were on fire. When I opened my eyes, I was flat on the ground, and so were my companions. I think that you are convinced now of the futility of opposition. 
So shall we stroll together in the direction of the river? You realize that you're creating an international incident. The United States of America does not stand for such treatment of its citizens. You better think twice. This thing can get out of hand. It may even become a matter for the consideration of the United Nations. And it can certainly lead to war. Indeed. That should be interesting. Professor, do you creatures really represent a scientific body? Why, of course we do. The De Long Institution. How quaint. And I'd like to have some things explained. Oh, I'd be very happy to oblige if I can. Oh, yes. I perceive your question. We are here to extract radium from the pitch blend in this valley. We do this with a portable furnace. The strange light you saw in the evenings occurred when we moved our furnace from place to place. We always do that at night. To do so during the day is inconvenient because the sun's rays are apt to create a local ether storm. Yes, I can see that it's mine. Uh, hey, look. What? Look ahead there. A flying saucer to end all flying saucers. As we rounded a huge boulder... There stood an enormous cylinder of metal. It towered at least 750 feet into the air and rested on a stone which could not have been more than four feet in diameter. Its huge bulk shored up by metal rods several hundred feet long which protruded from the ship where the barrel began to taper towards the stern. 500 feet up the side of the cylinder were controlling planes which looked tiny in comparison to the great bulk and indicated that it must travel through space at inconceivable speed. Around the base of the ship, squads of yellow men were rounding up the animals in cages and throwing them aboard. They worked with military precision, obviously under orders. Although no sound was uttered, since all communication was mental, as we approached the ship, four yellow men appeared with a large cage. And from a porthole about 75 feet above the stern, Another yellow man with a scintillating scar on his forehead stared down at us. Mr. Three drew himself up stiffly and saluted. What followed was a one-sided conversation put into words by Mr. Three, apparently, for our benefit. Yes, sir. No, sir. Ordinary ruby-blooded mammal, sir, with intelligence somewhat higher than monkeys, sir. They communicate with simple thoughts exactly as monkeys do, sir. By Catherine. They are absolutely insensible to all mental vibrations, sir, more completely than the four legged animals. I would suggest you take all four. They will prove very amusing, sir, in the National Zoo that attempts to deceive each other and even me, sir, are quite ridiculous. I believe you will find them much more humorous than chimpanzees. Sorry you haven't the stage. In that case, I suggest you take the brown one. He oh. is the best physical specimen and obviously better adapted to his habitat. None of them have any minds to see, sir. Oh. Very well, sir. As the yellow men broke in on his paddle over Sanders' knife, flashing and stabbing at his opponent, and every time his knife found a mark, green liquid spreaded from the yellow body. They finally disarmed him. And an answer to the thoughts that one of them was three seconds. I can't use my focusing rod. It might destroy what little mind he has. A moment later, they were carrying Pablo by arms and legs toward the cage. He turned his pathetic, bloody face toward me. Then you're forced for the most holy Mary, save me. And something snapped in my brain. I started toward Pablo's captain. Mr. Three leveled his focusing rod, and my brain seemed on fire, and everything went black. came to, the yellow men had vanished. The spaceship stood poised in the light of the setting sun, their thoughts and actions closed. The professor and Leroy were leaning over me. John, are you all right, John? I guess so. That jolt he gave you must have been a nasty. The other like the electric chair, I know. The cast off and the huge cylinder shot straight up through the air with a precision. Blue, green, yellow, orange, red. You 
may exactly, Joe. It was going so fast, the light of the exhaust ran through the entire color spectrum. It was traveling at least at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Look, look that phosphorescent glow. It's all over the hill. Yes. And it's all over us. Yes. I believe we are covered with the residual emanations of radium. I suggest we go down to the river and wash it off. Otherwise, it will presently kill us. Professor. Yes? Did you notice the green liquid spurting from those creatures when Pablo knifed them? Like green blood? It was not blood. That's chlorophyll. But, but how could... You see, gentlemen, Mr. Three and his comrades were not animals. They were plants. But... Possible. But true. Belio, you should be able to write quite an interesting book about this expedition. One that might even outsell reindeer in Iceland. Yes, Professor. But who would believe it? is produced and directed by William N. Robson. Tonight, we have presented Green Swatches, written in 1920 by T.S. Tribbling, and modernized and adapted for radio by Mr. Robson. Featured in the cast were Bill Conrad as Preston and Paul Fries as Professor Demetrius. Also heard were Ted DeCosia, Harry Bartell, Barton Yarborough, and Jay Novello. Special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... Trapped on a lost plateau in the shadowy depths of the Grand Canyon. At your feet lies a fortune in ancient gold, and beside you, holding a gun at your head, is a half crazed Indian from whom there is no escape. Next week, we escape with the story of a man who faced the murderous fanaticism of an ancient tribe to recover a fabulous treasure in golden relics. As Paul Pierce tells it in Grand Canyon Suite. Goodbye then until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. <laughs> Maybe you think there's no such thing as flying saucers, but Charlie McCarthy claims to have captured a flying saucer pilot, and he gets Van Heflin into the plot this Sunday night. You'll find it as merry a spin as Charlie and Edgar Bergen have taken you on. There's plenty of fun earlier when Al Jolson trades gags with Jack Bennett.